Uh, welcome everyone uh, to our lunch with Lincey's. Uh, my name is Cynthia Medagli of uh, Lincey's Conscious Business. Um, Lindsay's Conscious Business, our purpose is to help develop conscious leaders and businesses. Our speaker today is Susan Robertson, a successful entrepreneur or multipreneur, as we call her. Um, she is a CEO and co-founder of Lindsay's Conscious Business Group, LLC. Over these last 32 years, she co-founded Stop at Nothing and another business called Spirit Wisdom U. Uh, during these years, Susan has worked with senior executives worldwide, helping them improve bottom line performance by creating high performing cultures based on conscious awareness based leadership practices. Susan is the author of two books, Real Leadership, Wake into Wisdom, and due out next month, September, uh, is Real Culture, the Catalyst for Conscious Business. On a more personal note, another project is a chapter in an anthology for women who live their lives on purpose. The work is entitled Dreaming Your Purpose into Being. Welcome, Susan. Thanks, Cindy. Um, I will uh, just give a little bit more about my background and feel free. Um, we have Amara and Andrea and Cindy all here. We're monitoring the chat box and we are also monitoring the question box so that if you have any questions, please um, put the, your questions in there. We have a bit of a smaller group, so we can take a lot of questions and answer very specific questions if you'd like. You know, as Cindy said, my purpose in life is to help others and be in service of others. And I've been doing with this work with clients worldwide for more than 32 years. Um, I started out in banking and then started my own business. And it's been, it's been a wonderful journey because we've been able to travel the world and meet, meet a lot of different people and do a lot of work around engagement and culture and leadership development. So as Cindy said before, Lindsay's actually means keen insights in Latin. And whether that's keen insights in terms of personal awareness and emotional intelligence or analytical insights, which is what we do a lot with uh, conscious business, insight, Lindsay's conscious business, um, what we want to do is help people reimagine, reinvent, and revolutionize, whether it's their own leadership capabilities, uh, culture, uh, and creating high-performing culture, or to um, enable better performance. And that could mean to the bottom line, or me just becoming better as an individual. And so we're talking about employee involvement, engagement involvement. So the first thing I want to do is talk about the difference between the two. Employee uh, engagement is the emotional commitment that employees have to an organization. Now, I can be highly committed to an organization and be a cheerleader. And we, we want that kind of energy, but we also want, and this has been more in the terminology lately, involvement. And that is the direct participation of the workforce to fulfill uh, the mission by the employees bringing their own ideas and expertise and effort. And so we you really want engagement and involvement. So it's not that it, um, it's just satisfaction and happiness. It's that people are um, so willing to participate to help make the place a better place to work and to solve problems and to create better products and to meet, you know, as I keep hearing from our clients, meeting the customer objective or provide, providing excellent customer experience. So you really want your employees involved in um, applying their own ideas and expertise. So if you don't mind, please type in the chat box um, what it is that you want to learn by creating an engaged and involved workforce. What would be most important for you today? So that means you want to be typing right now either on your phone or your iPad or your um, computer what would be important to you and why? Um, so as you're typing that in there, why is it important for you to create an engaged and involved workforce? Some of the things that um, you put in, in here um, before we started, when we asked you at, at registration, why would you want to, um, is that helping people, somebody wrote, helping people deal with upsetting changes. There are a lot of changes going on out there that, um, are creating a lot of chaos and overwhelm. There are, um, some of you wanted engagement tactics and suggestions. Um, 
how do you engage in a virtual world and how do you help people become better leaders? And Kylie, you're talking about internal motivators that can help with driving engagement involvement. We'll talk a little bit about that today and how to ooh, engage different generations. Well, we'll, we'll work to try and do that. And what has, and how, how has it changed with remote virtual working and what do we need to do differently to engage workers? Yeah, that's, that's one of the big questions that we keep getting asked. And so uh, some of these things I'll be able to cover, but again, um, ask deeper questions along the way as I go through this, because my, I, my hope is I give you tools and tips to actually help with, and I'm just putting it into my head here, internal motivators, different generations, and the changing between remote and virtual working and what to do differently to engage workers. So in my book, Real Leadership Wake to Wisdom, we talk about how to create an engaged and involved workforce. And one of that is um, in order to create a good culture, you need to have real leadership. Um, real leadership means that you're driving resilience as a leader, you're creating engagement, you're offering the opportunity and creating an agile culture, and then you're using discernment and wisdom to lead. And right now, we need a, all of us need a crystal ball. And if we do that, then we can create a resilient culture. We can create an engaged and involved culture. We can create an agile culture where all of our teams are working in this way. And that will help us to create loyalty, which then allows us to create the performance that we're looking for, whether that is customer satisfaction or client delight or employee satisfaction, whatever it may be. And so um, the ability to, it, creating an engaged and well involved workforce is goes beyond just creating engagement. You actually need resilience. You actually need agility. You actually need some wisdom, leadership wisdom along the way. So I'm going to be touching on all of these topics um, here shortly. So we're focusing on engagement. So a couple of more things that as I, anytime I do one of these webinars, I like to look up what's sort of the latest and greatest information um, with uh, what's going on and with engagement. And ADP, which is, they, they do a lot with employee benefits and they recently got into the engagement and culture um, field. It, last year, they looked at the difference between disengaged, engaged, and fully engaged. And this sort of mirrors the Gallup stuff that only 16% are fully engaged. That means their, their minds, their hearts, their souls, as well as, um, uh, that they, they, they have the involvement part. That means a very a specific number generally, according to um, Gallup, only 33% per, and it went up to about 38% in April and May. So there's actually been an increase in engagement since COVID. And based on the work that we've been doing with our clients, we believe that's because people are being forced um, to really focus on engagement and, and pulling people together. So that actual, actual number has gone up. So according to Gallup, it's about 38% of actively engaged. That still means we're leaving a lot on the table. When people aren't, um, you can gather more engagement um, because most employees said that they will work harder. And so this means that the employees will bring more heart. If you just give them a little bit more appreciation, you know, thank them every so often. And particularly now, anything that you can do to show appreciation for what we are all going through, all of us who are working from home, all of us who are um, having to juggle raising children. I'm fortunate. I'm a grandmother. Um, I don't have to, to focus on that uh, myself, but I do get to hear uh, what my, my kids are going through with their grandkids. And how do you balance working a full-time job when you're trying to also educate your children at home? And finally, you know, highly engaged workforces experience a 41% lower absenteeism. The more important um, idea behind that, though, is that, you know, when they're absent, of course, they're not present, but sometimes people can be absent at work. And so highly engaged and involved people have presenteeism. And that's a whole um, uh, study in and of itself, the difference between presenteeism, people giving their full attention and focus while they are at work. And right now it's a little difficult to do that be only because some of us are remote and there's so many other things that we're concerned about. 
Another thought to think about is that, you know, employee engagement practices, when, when um, organizations are more engaged, they are 21% more profitable. And I've been reading these studies off and on for years that you just see more profitability. Why? Because when people put their hearts, minds, and souls into it, they're giving you the best of their best. And they're looking to, to help resolve more problems. So, and the, the last thing I'll say about this is that, um, and this has been more recent, uh, a more recent, um, not exactly super recent from the Society of Human Resources Management in 2016, that you know, when we have somebody leave us, it's gonna cost us approximately $5,000. Last week I was talking with a group of about 60 different business owners of, um, you know, construction companies, plumbing companies, um, restaurants, those kinds of businesses. And one of the things that we kept talking about was how that if they don't have high engagement and they don't have high involvement, they have a, a, you know, a revolving door and people will go out for the next 25 cents per hour rather than staying where the culture may be better. And so that was one of the questions they had is that we want to engage because we're, lo we're losing people, um, particularly in that hourly category. So let's go into what it really takes. When you creating an engaged and involved workforce requires these five qualities or factors or however you want to call it. Our real model, and you can read more about this in my book, Real Leadership, Waken to Wisdom, shows you that you need uh, resilience and agility and leading with wisdom. But when it comes to engagement, you need to have trust and transparency. You need to empower people. You need to create collaboration alignment. You need to help them grow. There's a lot going on around retooling right now. We're not gonna talk a lot about that one, but if, if you really want to create an engaged and an involved workforce, you need to retool people right now in their skills, particularly in the leadership skills, and then help people find meaning and purpose. You know, in July, we talked about how to build an agile culture in our Lindsay's with, with webinars. And, and so if you wanna go back and get some of that information, it's available to you on our website and on YouTube. So let's start with trust and transparency. And again, if you have any questions, please um, let me know. And Felipe, I'm gonna ask, um, uh, I'm gonna answer the question, how to engage new staff who've never met anyone in person nor have they been to the office. In fact, we are onboarding somebody this week whom we've only met through uh, a Zoom and we've hired, you know, by and we've never met um, at all. So we'll be able to give some, some answers around that. And in fact, I might even have her talk about what it was like. So that's a warning for you, Amara. So if you really want to have engagement in a virtual world, you must create the opportunity to connect. You know, when we were in the office, the opportunity to connect was always there. And um, we have to now actively create that. But many of us have had the mindset that, you know, that small chit chat stuff was not um, important. Now we're realizing the deep value of being able to talk while getting a cup of coffee or at the water cooler or in our little break room or cafeteria. So number one is you've got to, and I'm gonna deep dive each one of these. You wanna create the opportunity to connect, that's simple. You've gotta create psychological safety and that means creating a safe pl place for people to talk about their challenges. Now more than ever, we need to help these folks with stress management. And again, we have some resources for you. Back in April, we did a three-part series on stress webinars uh, on stress. And we also did one in May on how to rebalance and rebuild because a lot of people were needing to have more resilience. We have all of that available on our website. And the last thing, and this is often underestimated in terms of its um, impact and importance to trust, we have to create reliability. Right now, there is so much instability. When we can create reliability within our organizations, with us as human beings, with us within our teams, we're gonna create some stability. And when we create stability, we're gonna create some psychological safety. When we create psychological safety, we're gonna also create deeper connection and people will be able to perform better because there's gonna be less fear. 
So some of you asked about upsetting changes and connection while virtual. And so we'll start with connection and belonging. You know, the question is how to do this. How do you create connection when, like one of your questions here, when you've not really met the person in person? The most important thing, and I, people, I sometimes think really underestimate this, is you've got to set aside the time to just talk. Um, have meetings once a month that are dedicated to personal check-ins. Um, if you are virtual, if there's something that's difficult and you have a bigger group, sometimes you can ask a question like, how many of you are feeling scared right now or overwhelmed? Don't be afraid to ask those personal questions. I know that in my business, people will talk about how, you know, don't get into the personal, personal stuff. I think right now that that rule or that law, whatever you want to call it, needs to be thrown out the window because we need to be able to talk about those things. If you ask a question like that, how many of you feeling scared or overwhelmed and, and you get a poll, then you can follow that up with saying, okay, can you share a story or a best practice about what you're doing to help you with your feelings of overwhelm. And that opens up a conversation. That brings people together. That breaks down social barriers. And that levels the playing field. And leveling the playing field means that we are all human beings it, you know, suffering with the same stuff right now. Do some stress reduction. Back in May, we were working with another team. And the CEO asked us, he said, can you just do something that will allow us to take a mini break? And so we did a stress reduction mini break. We did a meditation with the group. And then we actually talked about how did they feel after the meditation. And it was like a five minute meditation and all the stuff around overwhelm, all the stuff around fear came out. And so we just created that opportunity for them to talk about that. It may sound simple, but these kinds of things are profound you know, in order to be able to start the conversation, to create the connection, to level the playing field as human beings. So um, type in the chat box again, is there anything that you've been doing to create connection with your team? Um, back in June, we asked something similar, this question, and we found out that one company, and they, they were having great success with this, so I'll, get, I'll share this as an example, is that in their coffee room, they, they had some people who were still working there, essential workers versus, um, I don't really like the term non-essential workers, but workers who don't have to go into the office, let's say. And so they had a coffee room where people would go in and there would be somebody waiting for them virtually and who would engage in conversation with them. And so they found that to be really successful in terms of being able to engage people. And it was almost like having a, an employee listening post set aside there. And so a virtual water cooler for the staff and join if you like, exactly. That's exactly what this particular company is doing. Now this particular company um, is a bottler for dairy products. You know, So they had a lot of people on the line. So that lunchroom was really an important space to say, hey, how's it going? Is there anything we can do to help? And so they ended up finding out just by setting that up, somebody being on a computer, like a little head, um, sitting there, hey, how are you? They found out a lot of information that they were able to utilize that information in order to be able to improve engagement as well as handle the situations with COVID. So you haven't heard anything about bad stuff happening on their manufacturing line because they've been able to listen, they gave the employees voice. You know, somebody else just wrote here, why, oh, I love that, wine down on Wednesday. Wine Wednesday, love that. Um, you know, from your sofa, from your terrace, share a glass of wine with employees. We have heard people doing a lot of that as well, you know, having that virtual happy hour and creating that connection. Because when you create connection, what happens is you, that's the foundation for psychological safety. You cannot have safety with people you don't know. We don't automate, none of us automatically trust people. So we start with connection. And the way to do that is you, what you wanna do is to reward healthy conflict, encourage people with differing views and thank people for when they have the courage to speak up. 
So what you want is you want people to share differing perspectives. You don't want people shooting the messenger with each other. And as a leader, when somebody brings up a weird or challenging idea, or maybe even a, an idea you had heard before, one of the simple things you can do to really create psychological safety, it's a facilitator um, tool, is just say, tell me more, tell us more. Encourage that person to speak more. Just asking people to tell you more tells you that you are listening to the employee voice, you are giving credibility to their art ideas, and they will be encouraged to share more. So now you're getting engagement and involvement. And then also point out brave acts. I like to call them brave acts, because if somebody brings up a difficult problem that everybody knows about, reward it publicly. That embeds the values of, you know, um, creating psychological safety and that we do want to hear opposing points of view here. So I like this, um, the Wine Wednesday um, with colleagues, business as usual performance view is done. Oh, that was great. Business as usual performance do is done for as an example. So these are all great ideas that people are now doing. Um, last week I heard um, other groups talking about um, this guy, you could tell he was just, he started a plumbing company 30 years ago. He knows plumbing. And he said, now I'm doing three minute videos and then we're having breakfast with me after the three minute video. I hate it. I want to just do my plumbing. But he understood that if he really wanted his employees, to, so he didn't lose his good uh, plumbers to other businesses because that's considered essential, he needed to reach out. He got out of his comfort zone and created three minute videos and you know donuts kind of thing. Getting people together in smaller groups and breakouts to start talking, exactly. Using Zoom, we use a lot of breakouts. Um, the other thing that we talk about is use a 5D model of communication. The disclosure, and I'll just go through this quickly, the 5D model, when, when you're getting people together to talk about something that's difficult, is one, you've got to start with disclosure. What are people saying and doing and what's getting in the way because of whatever the storyline is? So what are safe ways of disclosure? When we're in person, we call it a sticky exercise. We say, okay, tell us what's going on. Everybody writes in a black Sharpie on eight by six stickies and we say this is the story as we understand it and i always like to say get the facts get the fiction and get the impact you know provide those categories if you will what are the facts what are what is fiction and when people put it up there nobody's names is associated with it and because everybody's writing in black um sharpies that's great because many of us are virtual um there is Miro, the virtual whiteboard. I just learned about this last week. Uh, the, the people at Montessori are now using this uh, nationwide as a way of creating a sticky exercise where people can give information. Zeetboard is another one. There's also Jamboard, which is with um, Google. Um, dialogue, then once you have all of that information, there is your search for meaning. Look at the storyline, um, Padlet, Okay, great. So that's another whiteboard. Great um, to get to get people talking. And, and again, when you get all that information up there, it becomes impersonal, so that people don't feel like they're being shot. Um, you know, when you get the once you have that information up there, then you can dialogue, and that's just searching for meaning um, and ideas in terms of how you want to. Um, oops, I need to come over here. Um, how you may want to solve these ideas. And you just put it out as ideas. Because once you get done putting out all the ideas, you disclose the current reality, facts, and fiction, you dialogue about it, creating ideas. This is when you debate and discuss. And that's the time for a healthy debate. And when it's up on the wall and nobody's name against it, or it's on a, a whiteboard and nobody's name is against it, it's really nice because you actually end up seeing people talk about the pros and cons of all of the ideas and the storyline. And what we normally do is we actually have people outline what the problem statement is, come up with action steps for that problem statement, as well as come up with solutions for the cons, because oftentimes people will come up with what the cons are and then everything stops. No answer is going to be perfect, as you know. From there, you're able to um, decide you can't do it all, pick one or two things. And then the final one is, um, track progress. And so 
We are going to actually be doing a webinar on just this piece coming up soon. The, th the third thing, as I said before, and we tend to underestimate, is creating a reliable culture. And it's so simple. You know, when people will, I've, I've heard this said before, people will say, I, I like them, but I don't trust them. And generally, it means that they broke a promise. And it could be as simple as breaking a promise of um, getting you a report by Friday at three o'clock. But you've done it, people have done that enough times that you just know that person's never going to do it. So as a leader, create a culture where people make an honor and commitments and then push back if there are too many priorities, because if there's too many priorities, you're not going to make an honor commitments and hold people accountable for that. And so when we are in our team sessions, we only we have people create action plans to solve the issues. We have them create a team agreement, behavioral hand on heart. This is what I'm going to do. And then every for the team and then everyone completes an individual behavioral agreement and holding people accountable means that we're going to come back the following month and the following month to make sure that whatever we decided in that do from the, the 5D model that we're actually doing. And when you do that, you create liability. Reliability, as I said before, creates stability. State stability also helps create safety and security. So I put this up here because this is another way to create a reliable culture is to use our DARE Agile methodology. I'm not going to go into it, but you can find the webinar as well as this toolkit on our website. So with that, Trust and transparency. If you work on focusing on mental well being and psychological safety, it improves employees' risk taking and willingness for them to stick their head out, it increases uh, creativity and flexibility, and it provides a platform for feedback and trust and openness. And this allows us to achieve breakthrough results. So, one final thing I like to see if um, people will be willing to make a commitment. List in the chat box your favorite way to develop trust that we just did. And now list um, one thing that you will do differently. Will you focus more on reliability? Will you create more gatherings? So go ahead and put that in the chat, please. Just trying to get a commitment. Oftentimes if we type it down, we'll, it's like writing it down, we will follow through. So lead by example, hold people accountable. Yes, we hold people accountable. We're gonna create reliability that creates stability. Exactly. Great. Thank you. And I'll keep looking here. So again, creating an engaged and involved workforce requires trust and, and transparency, empowerment, collaboration, uh, growth and development, meaning and purpose. Um, we will be going over some of these other ones as we, we do these once a month and we'll be covering empowerment and value we'll be doing in November. Uh, thank you. You're going to focus more on psychological safety, uh, make people feel heard. Yes, if you look at our rebalance and rebuild uh, webinar, you can get some more ideas on that because really people need a place now to talk um, and feel normal. So talking to our peers and feeling normal will be important. And it does, you don't have to go deep, 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 just like, yeah, yeah, I'm overwhelmed too. What are you doing about it? I'm feeling scared too. What are you doing about it? And leveling the playing field. Thank you very much. So I will leave you with two questions for the end of the day. Since engagement involvement requires trust and transparency, trust and transparency requires connection, psychological safety and reliability. What is your strength? And what can you do to build on it? And you just already answered the question, what can you do to improve areas that you're not focusing on? With that, we're coming to the end. Join us next time in October. We're actually gonna be doing a little, we're skipping a September. We're gonna do a webinar on leadership soulology, the study of uh, the, the soul of leadership and why leading with wisdom and heart matters. November 17th, we are going to be doing the empowerment portion of engagement and involvement. And if you would like, this Friday at noon, we are going to have a 45-minute, your question answered, um, some of the ones that you want to deep dive some of these questions. It's just going to be a very informal, casual talk, and then we keep it private. We don't record it to just, you know, get a little ideas, mentoring, and coaching. Um, so if you want to do that, put yes um, and 
I know some of you might have other um, employees that you might want to have join. They're welcome to join. Just type yes in the chat box. You'll also get a reminder tomorrow for signing up for your questions answered. And with that, I want to um, say thank you. And I hope you join us in October for Leadership Soulology and then in November when we talk about empowerment. So Kylie will definitely get you on that list um, and others, you know, so if only one of you shows up, then you'll get a one-on-one -on -one coaching session for 45 minutes. If you want to bring a friend, there'll be two of you. Um, we'll be happy to uh, have that opportunity. So thank you very much. Have a great day and uh, keep it real. Talk to you later. Bye.